Of all the greatest symphonies ever written, epic masterpieces written by the best minds humanity has ever produced, from Brahms and Bruckner to Tchaikovsky and Mahler, all of them owe their existence in one way or another to the work of Joseph Haydn. Throughout Haydn's staggering 50-year-long career, he ushered in a new era in music. The first man to ever challenge Bach's legacy, the only man in history who taught both Mozart and Beethoven during his lifetime. A man whose music aimed to depict not only the creation of the world, but also the very universe itself. Filling his music with so much ingenuity, humour and joy that you can't help but smile, as if every note was engineered to imbue you with vitality and vigour. So here is the life and music of Joseph Haydn. By the way, if you're interested in dramatically improving your sight reading, writing and ear training skills, then I'm hosting a live free workshop on that soon. There's more details at the end of this video or in the description. Franz Joseph Haydn was born in 1732 in a swampy little village in Austria called Rohrau. His family was very musical, frequently singing folk songs with their neighbours. Franz Joseph displayed remarkable musical ability from a very early age, being described as having a great voice with perfect intonation. So his parents sent him away at the age of six to receive an education from a choir master at the church of Hainburg. Life wasn't easy for young Haydn, and he was often kept underfed, dirty and extremely busy. But hardships never seemed to weigh him down and he always looked cheery and content, even in his darkest moments. He was eventually recruited for the choir in St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, where he also learned how to play the keyboard and the violin. It was perhaps here that he gained the experience needed to write the vocal works that we see later on in his career. He stayed with this cathedral for nine years until he lost his child's voice, and then he was unceremoniously kicked out with only three shirts and a dirty coat to his name. Alone, hungry, and far from home, he was forced to fight for his very existence. At this point, he could have gone back home and worked for his father or become a priest, but no, he wanted to be a composer. Not just some mediocre musician, but a real master of composition. For the next eight years, Haydn supported himself with odd musical jobs. He performed as a street musician, and he also taught music, attempting to make his living as a freelancer. He studied treatises from late Baroque composers like Johann Fuchs, Johann Mattheson, David Kellner, and he was heavily influenced by the works of C.P.E. Bach, who is J.S. Bach's son. He finally met the elderly Italian composer Niccolo Porpora, who took Haydn under his wing, and it's here that he learned the fundamentals of composition. Works from Haydn's early adulthood were very much a product of their time, and unlike Mozart or Beethoven, these early works didn't find immediate success. His early style was based on Rococo music that was popular back then, and this music emphasised simplicity and elegance, but without the nuance and maturity of the later classical period, or the complexity and richness of the Baroque period that came before. That being said, Haydn did have some flashes of brilliance here. Just listen to the celebrative joy that permeates the beginning of his credo in the Missa Brevis in F. <laughs> and how it unexpectedly delves into sombre tonality. Before finishing in triumph. Or listen to the introduction of the adagio of his first string quartet that reminds you of some of Beethoven's late quartets. As it then blossoms into this beautifully lyrical violin theme.
There's also his cello concerto in C major, which remains one of the greatest solo pieces ever created for this instrument. Every movement in this last work is written in sonata form. In fact, Haydn was one of the most important people in the development of sonata form. It's in his music that we first see sonata form in its mature form. If you want to learn more about sonata form, then you can check out the video I've made on it on my channel. Eventually, Haydn was able to land a job as Kapellmeister, essentially a conductor for Count Karl Joseph Mortzin's orchestra, and then later went to work for the very wealthy Esterhazy family, whom he would serve for 29 years. During this time, he fell in love with Therese Keller. However, he wasn't allowed to marry her. Instead, Haydn, who may have felt pressured by his newfound success, married her sister, Maria Anna Keller. It would not be a happy marriage, and this decision would haunt him for the rest of his life. Both of them enjoyed numerous affairs and had no children. Working for the Esterhazys meant that Haydn had to spend long stretches of time isolated in their countryside palace. This starved him of deep human connections. His wife didn't care much about him, and the prince wouldn't allow any close friendships between the staff. And so, Haydn was only able to vent his feelings of loneliness through his music. <laughs> This period is known as the Sturm und Drang period, or Storm and Stress, and it was a time where a lot of the composer's music took a dark turn, often written with greater passion and intensity than ever before. Here we feel that Haydn was at his most vulnerable. The orchestra at the Esterhazy Palace didn't fare much better. Musicians had to remain at the palace for months on end, and they weren't allowed to bring their families. At one point, their stay was getting so long, they begged Haydn to intervene. And that he did. Haydn wrote his famous 45th symphony, the Farewell Symphony, almost an overt plea to his symbolic captors. It opens with a ravenous storm of minor arpeggios. It's one of his most dramatic works, and towards the end, the musicians are instructed to blow out their candles and leave one by one until only two violinists remain. It's a work of great significance, and the Count understood its meaning immediately and allowed his musicians to leave the very next day. During one of Haydn's few visits to Vienna, he met a young man by the name of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and they instantly formed a very strong friendship. It's hard to understand how such a bond can exist between two vastly different people, Haydn being twice Mozart's age, and by all accounts a far more serious man. But Haydn constantly praised his fellow composer, calling him the greatest composer known to me either in person or by reputation. Mozart would in turn dedicate his Haydn quartets to him, modelled after Haydn's own revolutionary Russian quartets. There is no doubt that they both heavily influenced one another, and Mozart's unexpected death would cause Haydn great pain. In 1790, his Esterhazy patron passed away, and so Haydn was finally allowed to leave their service. A longtime friend, Johann Peter Salomon, had just come from England, promising Haydn a large orchestra, generous revenue, and a crowd eager to hear his works. But most importantly, he also promised Haydn something he had deeply desired after almost 30 years of service. Freedom. And so, together, they departed to England. Haydn said his final goodbyes to Mozart. Mozart remarked to Haydn, you have no education for the wide world, and you speak so few languages. To which Haydn replied, But my language is understood all over the world. They would never see each other again.
In London, Haydn became a superstar. His concerts sold out immediately, with electrified crowds demanding regular encores, and he received hundreds of new commissions. Here, at the age of 58, he was at the height of his powers, and it was here that he composed the London Symphonies, 12 of the greatest symphonies ever created over the span of three years. A summary of all that he had learned throughout his life of over 90 symphonies. The first London Symphony, which is his 93rd, begins as its entire force rains down on you with unrelenting power. After which, slow and gracious violin notes begin to establish the piece's underlying key of D major. As we are then presented with its various themes. The second movement lulls you into a false sense of security as the violin lazily dances over a mellow bed of strings. and then viciously rocks you back into reality. The B section's waltz-like character has this delicate rhythm and it makes you think of Tchaikovsky. Towards the end, Haydn's great sense of humour shines through. Just imagine yourself leaning back in your chair as your muscles begin to loosen one by one and the orchestra slowly dies down one section at a time. Haydn's music is full of these practical jokes and light-hearted moments. The final movement of the 93rd symphony displays a great contrast between themes. The first theme brims with this quiet enthusiasm as if it's clamouring to go out somewhere, anywhere, and roam around the world. The second theme wisely attempts to calm it down, but to no avail, as the first theme dominates the movement. These symphonies express a rare feeling that neither Mozart's effortless agility nor Beethoven's dramatic grandiosity could ever capture. Listening to Haydn is like walking through the countryside. It has this rustic simplicity to it, aided by its folk-like melodies that he enjoyed using, such as in the finale of his last symphony. It's just music that makes you smile. After three years in London, Haydn returned to Vienna. He met Beethoven at this time, although their relationship was quite rocky. Haydn took Beethoven on as a pupil, but he wasn't very fond of his youthful arrogance, and in turn, Beethoven didn't take Haydn's teachings very seriously. However, their relationship did improve later on. Around this time, Haydn began working on his magnum opus, inspired by Handel's oratorios. Haydn chose to portray the Bible's version of the creation of the world in an epic, massive scale oratorio. For two long years, Haydn was fully absorbed by this work. This was going to be the piece he would be remembered for. He wanted to show us what he thought the world was really like. A world that, despite all our struggles, can still be a good and beautiful place. He was finally able to pour all his good spirit, energy and love of life into one single piece to celebrate the universe. The creation begins as the orchestra menacingly announces its presence. Then, a sombre melody emerges with great uncertainty. Naked and alone, it attempts to grasp at any semblance of stability, as it is only presented with disjointed chords and brooding tension. Throughout the next five minutes, Haydn paints a bleak picture, a void of infinite proportions from which a solitary voice appears. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was without form. From the shroud, a muted choir slowly reveals itself. And in a moment, in a mere second, the entire universe comes into existence. Let there be light. <laughs> Tom
culminating in this huge globe-spanning fugue. In just 12 minutes, Haydn gives us a masterclass in musical tension and release. Just the overture alone is its own masterpiece, a lesson for the ages. The piece is divided into three parts, with the first and second parts taking place during the creation of Earth and its inhabitants. And the third part describes Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and it's just filled with these little bits of musical genius and drama. It has these wonderful examples of tone painting and effects, like this moment depicting the first storms. <laughs> sunrise, and even a lion. I highly recommend experiencing this piece for yourself. I recommend listening to Adam Fisher's version with the Austro-Hungarian Haydn Philharmonic Orchestra and turning on the subtitles too if you want to accompany the story. By the end of this piece, Haydn was so exhausted that he was unable to sit down at the piano for several days, but it had worked. Despite most of his works being neglected in the 1800s, his creation continued to be a staple in many German-speaking countries. In his last years, Haydn continued to write religious works, but as his body began to fail from old age, he could no longer keep on composing, having to spend the last six years of his life mostly confined to his home. Musical ideas would torment his mind day and night, but he could not write them down. He could barely even play the piano. It was torture. On his 76th birthday, a performance of The Creation was held, conducted by Salieri and with Beethoven and all of his friends in attendance. The concert was extraordinary. The old master was so visibly shaken that he had to be taken out. People gathered around him with tears in their eyes, shaking his hand, embracing him, and everyone knew that his days were numbered. A year later, on the 31st of May 1809, as Napoleon's troops marched through Vienna, Joseph Haydn passed away at the age of 77. His funeral was attended by people from all walks of life, and Mozart's Requiem was played. And so ended the life of Joseph Haydn, often overshadowed by Mozart and Beethoven as the lesser of the big classical three, yet utterly essential for both of them. He was the connecting figure, a man who spent almost all of his long life dedicated to his craft. A friend to many, a devout man, the sleeping giant of music history. But if there is any quote that can define his greatness, I think this is the one. Often when contending with obstacles of every sort that interfered with my work, often when my powers both of body and mind were failing and I struggled to persevere on the course I had entered on, a secret feeling within me whispered, there are but few contented and happy men here below. Grief and care prevail everywhere. Perhaps your labours may one day be the source from which the weary and worn, or the man burdened with affairs, may derive a few moments' rest and refreshment. What a powerful motive for pressing onwards. How's your sight reading, your musical writing skills, your ear training? If you want to seriously improve your musicianship, then you need excellent foundations. And I believe you can learn these foundations in one week. These are essential skills for a musician, and they can open so many doors for you. So if you want to join this live free workshop that I am hosting on these essential musical skills, then you can visit the link in the description below. Great musicians need real training. So visit the link in the description for this free live workshop, which is happening at the end of August. Thank you for watching.